I want to talk a little bit tonight just kind of a, from an interesting perspective, a perspective I've never really delved a whole lot into, but ultimately we're, gonna, we're not going to be here long tonight, but I, I, I just want to examine a few of the things that Jesus, when he came, we're celebrating his coming into the world and then ultimately what he did for us. But as we, as we do this, I want to start off by just backing up things just a little bit prior to him coming here. You know, prior to Jesus coming here, Jesus is God, was God, forever has been God. He is a part of the Trinity, Father, Son, that's Jesus, and Holy Spirit. And for eternity past, which is without end, time without end, They've been in this wonderful relational thing, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, perfect love being exchanged between them. And then conversations appeared in heaven prior to them coming here among themselves. They were constantly communing and strategizing even, if you will, I believe, about what to do as it related to us. And I wanna just take a moment to start there and make sure we all get this, you know, if you're not familiar with this type of interaction between the Godhead, I think it adds a layer of just beauty to what we're doing and celebrating here tonight. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and A, this is just a little snapshot into the types of conversations that God had within himself, within the Godhead. God said, right, let us, there we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit talking. Let us, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. This is the Godhead communing within itself and, and fellowshipping and dreaming about you and me. Let us make man in our image. In our let him have dominion over everything on the planet. That's again God's intention from the beginning. It's still God's intention that we would be just like he is in so many ways, enjoying, like he enjoys uh, the love relationship that he has within himself, that we would enjoy and be called into that same relationship. And it's that kind of interaction that God had with the Son, with the Holy Spirit. We see another snapshot of this. I'm just randomly pulling a few verses just to get us all on the same page here before we get to the real meat of what I think the Lord wants us to consider tonight. Isaiah 6 and 8. Here's the prophet Isaiah. As the Lord is speaking to him, it's in the year that King Uzziah dies, and it says, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Again, we've got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they're asking questions, who will go for us, right? This is this relational thing. And I'm saying all of this because when we talk about Jesus coming to earth, Jesus being born of a virgin, this stuff was talked about prior to it happening, and he willingly decided he would be a part of this submission to this human thing, that he would actually have to come down and be clothed with humanity. Jesus did this as an act of love for his Father because God the Father so loved the world that he gave his Son, his only Son, his one and only Son. Let's pull that verse up because it's really important to what we're celebrating here. He gave his son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. How beautiful that God the Father, this is his part of the conversation, so loved the world that he sent his son. It's important for us to realize the son said amen to that. John 10 and 17, for this reason, this is now Jesus speaking. It says, for this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. This is voluntary stuff. But I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. See, if we don't pay attention to this stuff, we'll miss something so powerful that God the Father so loved the world 
But he loved the son, and the son loved him, and the son said, Father, that sounds like a great idea. I want to be a part of that. Let's do that. And I'm going to show my love for you by coming and laying my life down. Now, we think of the laid down life of Jesus when we think about him going to a cross, which he did. That was the point where he physically died. But let me just submit this to you. Jesus died prior to that when he took on and submitted to the human life experience. He had to die to the glorious place he was in in heaven. He, he let go of so many things. He divested himself of all these pleasures of just perfect, he, no limitations. He was God and enjoying that, no doubt, you know. And then he says, I'm going to go and I'm going to lay my life down. I'm going to do that, Father. And it all began with him being willing to be conceived supernaturally into the womb of a woman and have to like you and I came into the world, experience from the womb what it means to be human. He submitted to all things human. That's the laying down of Jesus' life, the beginning of it, just to submit to the whole process that we've been living in. He fully experienced everything. You know, the conception itself, if you were here this morning, we looked at this verse together, Isaiah 7 and 14. It's a great Christmas verse. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. She shall call his name Emmanuel. You know, this is a miracle, obviously. A woman who does not have a physical relationship with a man suddenly finds herself pregnant and here Jesus experiences what conception is like and about, and he's suddenly by the Father in the womb of a virgin woman here on earth. And the miracle of that is something that's supposed to make us stop and go, only God could do such a thing. You know the miracle of conception? They say, and, and pardon me here, but they say that you know, you think about your own life and conception. Do you know that when, sorry, your mom and dad got together, you were one of 300 million little things swimming looking for an egg? Sorry, don't know how else to say that. One of 300 million. That's you. You, you, you talk about odds stacked against you for life. The miracle, just the miracle of human conception. Your life, my life is a miracle. We beat 300 million others. Who said you're not a success? I mean, come on, if anybody ever says you're not a success, they're, they're, they don't know what they're talking about. You beat 300 million. That's like the population of the United States a couple years ago. You succeeded. Yay. Here you are. Awesome. But you think you overcame something. Jesus had to be conceived without any human. It was a God. You talk about the miracle. You talk about him, someone who overcame odds. You overcame a lot of odds. He overcame the ultimate set of odds. It's absolutely outside of any human calculation, the conception of Jesus Christ in the womb. Amazing. And, and, and we're supposed to be in awe of our own conception and birth, but how much more the beauty, the power, the wonder that this season is supposed to bring to us when we consider what God did, the miracle. You know, the womb is an interesting place. Do you remember it? <laughs> Not so, come on, what happened to you? It's an interesting place. It's a place where God forms us and actually prepares us. Now, I'm going to prove this to you from the scripture. For life, both physically, we're in the womb, we are fashioned and formed, and Jesus was conceived. Come on, Jesus had to experience all things human. So he was submitted to the space called the womb inside of his mother, and in that place he was formed physically, and spiritually he began to uh, be equipped, and I can show you this in certain re re uh, realities here from the scripture. Just look at it with me quickly. 
Because I want us to get somewhere concerning this whole womb thing. Jeremiah chapter 1 and 4. This is an interesting insight into the call of the prophet Jeremiah. Here's what the Lord says to Jeremiah. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. That's eternity past. And before you were born, that's talking about in the womb, I consecrated you while you were in the womb, and I appointed you, or the King James says, I ordained you while you were in the womb, a prophet to the nations. All that was going on in the womb. God says, I knew you before the womb, but once I put you in there, in that place, I consecrated you in that place. I ordained you in that place. I began to fashion you in that place. I began to mold you and make you getting ready for what I had in mind for your life. Jesus submitted himself to the same thing. We know that in the womb, kind of just hang with me here for a few minutes, because what I'm saying is going to make sense if you just hang on. Luke 1 and 4, I'm just talking about what Jesus went through in the womb and why the womb matters. We think the womb is just a place where everything doesn't matter, and then one day you pop out, now everything starts to matter. I'm trying to say that stuff matters in the womb, and Jesus had to be there, and he had to experience all this stuff inside the womb. Luke 1 and 44, this is the Christmas um, exchange between, I call it the Christmas exchange because it's often read during this time of year, and it's related to the conception and the birth of Mary and Elizabeth. For behold, this is Elizabeth now who's got John the Baptist in her womb six months prior. And now you've got Mary who's pregnant by the Father, or by God, Holy Spirit comes over her. She's conceived uh, Jesus in her womb and she shows up at her cousin Elizabeth's house and what happens? The baby, John the Baptist, in the womb, gets real excited. Listen to it. For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. It wasn't just the pizza she had the night before or some type of diet thing, you know. John the Baptist in his mother's womb when he got around Jesus in the womb had some kind of sense for what was going on outside the womb. Now, this is where we're going, so hang with me. In the womb, the babe, John, could experience the presence of God in the womb. In the womb, he knew when he was near his calling, he was to prepare the way of Jesus, and in a little while, he was going to be outside the womb, physically in this world, being raised up as a prophet, and then ultimately declaring who Jesus was to the world of that area. In the womb, he's kicking and leaping for joy. So we know it's safe to say you can be ordained in the womb. That's what Jeremiah was said of Jeremiah. In the womb, you can experience something going on outside the womb. Joy, a sense of some bigger purpose, a sense of some big other thing beyond what the womb allows you to see and taste and experience. So, I'm not going to spend any more time tonight establishing this point, but I just believe that Jesus, when he submitted himself to come into the world as this little babe we, we often look at at Christmas time, I want to reel the film back just a little bit and say that he said, I'll come and I'll be in the womb and I'll let things in the womb, I'll experience what being in the womb is like. Now, you may ask yourself, okay, I get it. Yeah, I, I kind of see that. There's stuff that goes on that, that we can, as babies... You know, they say a pregnant mama can play certain types of music. Or, and, and babies can, can respond, react to atmospheres around them in the home, in the house. If it's a really stressful, tense, harsh environment, the babies also can be a bit uh, annoyed by that or traumatized in some ways. I believe that. I, I think that's biblical, and I think it's very real. So there are some things we can say that... Clearly, you can experience, a baby can experience in the womb, and we, although we don't typically remember what the womb was like, we were experiencing stuff when we were in our mother's womb. We just were. All right. But some things don't make any sense to the baby in the womb. I'm confident of this. I was talking to my grandson the other day, and he's 13, and he's my buddy. And, uh, you know, he's 13. He's, he's trying to figure life out. And you remember 13. 
And um, so he's got lots of questions. And so I just kind of give him these open-ended, like, anything you want to ask me today? Anything, man. Talk about anything. Whatever you want to talk about, let's talk. And so he comes up with some stuff that stretches me out there sometimes, you know. And so he came up with this question about life after death and about um, people that you love that pass on. Maybe before they died, they might say to you, when I get to the other side, I'm going to give you some signs that I'm here. How do you know? I'm like, oh, here we go. How do you know? And so I went down this path with him because I believe it's the right path. I think it's something that we should all consider because I believe that this life that we're in right now is like the womb of eternity. Okay. Now, if you... Huh? Well, I'm, I'm glad you like that. You should come back here. It's a really good church. I think you'll like it. I believe this life is like the womb of eternity. I just do. And if you were a baby, go ahead. Just kind of try to imagine with me for a moment back to when you were a baby. No, this is not some psycho babble thing. Let's go back to your womb experience. But let's just say you, you, you can, for a moment, just imagine what maybe life was like in the womb because we already said that you can feel joy. John leaped for joy. You know, there was something going on. He was being formed in the womb and so on. So you were experiencing something. And let's just think you're in there, and, and you're starting to kind of think a little bit, like, and, like, you got hands. And maybe you, you ask yourself the question as a baby in the womb, what are hands for? Well, clearly they're for poking the side of the mama's belly. That's what they're for. Feet, what are they for? Feet, oh, kicking the side of mama's belly. That's exactly what they're for, right? A nose, what's it for? Who knows? You know, in the womb, I mean, that's a hard one to figure out. It's hard. You know, so I was telling my grandson, I said, you know, I said, in this life, we're over here trying to make sense out of what all these things are in a space that is not the ultimate place for which they were designed to be expressed. It's a temporal realm. It's an important realm, but it's designed, it's the womb of something greater, something eternal. And I said, so as long as we're down here trying to force our rationale of what, you know, so the point is, in the womb, a lot of stuff doesn't make sense. Just like in this life, a lot of stuff doesn't make sense. Am I telling the truth? It's like we're over here trying to, to make it make sense, like these feet have to be with no clue that just outside of this space, things that make no sense now will make a lot of sense when we see it from God's perspective. That's important to me because Jesus experienced this space called the womb, a place that doesn't make sense, and he learned to live beyond this temporal world. He experienced humanity and all of its frustrations, all of the things that naturally speaking, and in this fallen condition we find ourselves in, in this current state of the world, don't make sense. Jesus went through it all. He went through it all so we could make it through it all and enter into the real purpose, the eternal purpose, the plan that God had from the beginning. Are you frustrated? You know, I was thinking about what Jesus in the womb must have been like. Life must have been like for him. We've already said that you as a baby can experience things from within the womb that are going on outside the womb. John leapt when he got near something going on outside the womb. He experienced something. What do you think Jesus' life was experiencing? You know, when... Joseph and Mary are having to communicate together and deal with all kinds of misunderstanding in the Jewish community about his conception. I bet, now you might not agree, and I'm okay, I'm taking a little liberty here, but I bet there were some stressful moments in the house of Joseph and Mary as the pressure from their social community being accused, Mary, of being 
you know, having been in fornication or having had sexual relationships outside of marriage, those accusations, those gossiping rumors were floating around. How do we know this? Because even the Pharisees said to Jesus, we be not born of fornication. Those were their words. It was a part of the rumors of Jesus' birth and conception. I just have to say that I believe in Jesus' womb experience, he could pick up on all the tension going on outside the womb. I believe that. Now, you might not agree, and it's okay. I'm just telling you, I, I think there's biblical precedent for it. Clearly, there was a lot of stress and pressure on the household of the Holy Family. A lot of stress, a lot of pressure. Maybe that's a picture of your home right now. Maybe your home's got a lot of stress and pressure on it. Maybe there's stuff going on. I, I have to think about Jesus' experience in the womb. You know, he experienced a really bumpy ride on a donkey at a very inconvenient time. You know, it was Christmas when he was on his way there. Ha ha, that's a joke. You should have laughed. He was on his way to Bethlehem. Why? Because of a census, a tax, but it was a census. It wasn't convenient. Nobody wanted to do it. And here's Jesus in the womb. We're asking the simple question, what was Jesus experiencing in the womb? Why? Because I believe he tasted everything human. And if you're still kind of with me, I believe this life is like the womb of eternity. Jesus had to face and deal with bumpy rides. Anybody having a bumpy ride tonight? Come on. Life's been bumpy for you. Got a lot of extra pressures on you right now. Maybe there's stuff going on that doesn't make any sense. Come on, why are we having to go somewhere else? Can't we just stay home? Can't we just be settled? Can't we be in one place? No, here he comes, the savior of the world, and in the womb, tasting the human experience to the fullest. I think a bit of a microcosm of what we all experience in this life, which is the womb of eternity. Stress. Situations. A frantic husband, Joseph, knocking on doors and no room in the inn. My dear wife, she's looking at me, what's he gonna say now? Every time I, <laughs> you know, I, it's so funny and not how the Lord does these things, but I mentioned coming tonight without my tablet. I'm confessing my sins publicly before you all. Stressed, stressed, thinking I can't believe this. Knowing good and well, I'm about to get up and talk about stress. You know, it's really good when you can experience it firsthand and then talk about it because hopefully it's got a little reality attached to it. Am I alone? Come on, is life bumpy? Does stuff not make sense sometimes around you? Like you're trying to, 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 to force the purpose for feet in the womb for kicking when the reality is there's got to be something more to my life. There's something more to what God's been doing in me than all this temporal world. And yet we're here on the inside of this space we're in, limited space we're in, trying to make sense of it all. And it's really frustrating until we allow God to help us get outside of that. So Jesus was born so we could be born again. He was born. He came out of the womb so we could come out of the womb of this limited, natural world that we're in. You know, once you get born again, here's what the scripture says, you get a new set of eyes. Did you know that? Yeah. Jesus said to Nicodemus, except you be born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. You can't even see. But once you get born again, you actually get a new set of eyes. It's awesome. You know, the scripture says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. When you're 
in this world, and I hope I'm making some sense. I know I'm out here in kind of a really kind of interesting type of message, perhaps. But when you're in this world, kind of limited in this world, and all the stuff that doesn't make sense, you, can, you, you, you get confused about what the purpose is for it all. But once you get born again, you start to see the way you're supposed to see. You can see outside the limits of this temporal world. Taste and see. You can actually, you can actually start touching and, 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 and handling the word of life. The Bible says, lay hold of eternal life. We can actually start, things will start to make sense is the point. When we allow God to transition us from all this natural stuff into something supernatural something deeply satisfying, something eternal, that you'll start leaping in your earthly womb for joy. Come on, get a little kick in your step because of what God's doing outside of this temporal little existence we find ourselves in that's constantly leaving us frustrated. It's constantly leaving us wondering why I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. And God says, you got to get outside that mindset. You got to come with me into a new space an eternal space. And in that space, you know, we're, we're getting ready to overwhelm our sensory realm. Food, fragrant candles, you know, video games. Young people say, yeah, that's awesome, right? You know, sensory, 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 sensory stuff. And I say, have a blast, don't eat too much, enjoy yourselves but don't miss the point. All of that stuff at the end of the day won't make sense to the real purpose for why you're here. All that stuff isn't gonna ultimately satisfy. You're more than that stuff. You're more than food. You're more than clothes. You're more than gadgets. You're more than things. You have an eternal from before the mother's womb, but even in the womb, planned by God, life, eternal deeply satisfying. So my challenge for me and for all of us is to start seeing with spiritual eyes, start tasting with spiritual mouths. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Start living out of a different space that makes more sense than all this temporal space where we're frustrated and aggravated and life is real bumpy along the way. No room in the inn, but God has room for us all. So, we're going to light some candles. You say, why do we do this? Well, because there was one who came into the world. He, Jesus, is the light of the world. That's what he says of himself. He says, I am, talking of himself, the light of the world. And then a little bit longer down in his talking, he says, you are the light of the world. I'm the first candle, and you all are the candles lit by me, or that's his intention. So tonight, I know it's a symbolic thing, but we're going to receive. We've got a candle. Did everybody get a candle when they came in here? Yes, got a yes, sir. I'm asking tonight that it's more than just a symbol to you. You know, we're doing the Christmas Eve thing. Okay. Maybe if in our hearts we'll mix a little faith here tonight, and as we take from this altar area some of the fire that's at the altar, and we hand it off to each other, if you're a parent with kids, they are your responsibility. <laughs> okay. Um, but I'm asking that by faith, as we do this together, that we're saying to God again, God, I receive the light of life, which is Jesus Christ. I receive this gift. Maybe you're here tonight, and for you, you're not even sure ultimately that you've ever really done that, like made Jesus Lord of your life. Why not tonight? Why not, as your candle is being lit in your own heart, why don't you just say, I receive into my heart 
and into my life, the Lord Jesus, as Savior and Lord. I accept this mandate to not only have this light, but to shine this light for others to see. The hope of all the world. you know how many people right now are going through things that don't make any sense to them? You know what the answer is? You must be born again. You've got to be born again. None of it makes sense until you're born again. And all it is is about putting your trust and your faith in the Lord Jesus. We have the privilege of modeling outside the womb while yet still in the womb. And I know that sounds strange. We're here in this life, but we can model something bigger and better. We can demonstrate and put it on display. And that's really what this is about tonight. So we're going to do that. I'm going to ask my my beautiful wife to help me here tonight. And uh, uh, let's see. We've got a video with some more. Why don't we stand up together, if you don't mind. And I'm going to ask Christy that you'll come and get uh, some of the fire off of a candle, and then you'll light my candle, and then I'll pass it on. And I want to pray for each of us here tonight. <clears throat> and we can go ahead and play this uh, video, which has got words for us to feast on the wonder and the miracle of the Lord. Can we turn off the uh, air that's blowing? I think that might help us too. Thank you. If you'll go to that side and you can start lighting the Father, tonight in Jesus' name, we just want to thank you from the womb of this world that often makes no sense. I thank you for causing each one of us. Brent, now if you'll take that and start passing it along. Yeah, if somebody's candle goes out, it's no big deal. That's life. Go get fired up again. Let somebody help you reclaim your flame. God, would you make us a bright and a shining light in this world where people are so disillusioned, so confused. They have no idea what's going on and why it's going on. You can pass the light on to each other. You don't have to wait for Pastor Christy. You can start passing this light on. That's the way it's supposed to work. We hand to each other the light. And as I said, if your light happens to go out, just go get it relit somewhere. There's a good message in that too. Maybe you used to walk with Jesus and you kind of drifted away. It's okay. Come on. Get your candle lit again. Thank you, Father. We worship you tonight. Father, we receive this light, this eternal light. In this temporal world in which we live, tonight, Lord, the womb of this temporal world, we choose to awaken to what's really going on outside the limits of this world. The frailties, human physical frailties, Things that don't make sense. God, I thank you today for awakening us once again to the eternal plan, the big picture, the reason we celebrate the birth of our King, the one who came, tasted of all things human, and was born to die and to raise again from the dead that we too might be born again. I thank you for the joy of escaping the limits of this fallen world. 
I thank you for eternal life tonight. And we accept this light, your gift to us. We accept it, Lord, not only for us, but for the world to see. Would you put us on display for the world to see what it means to know you, what it means to have hope again, what it means to escape the corruption of this world. I thank you that as we celebrate in our homes or wherever we find ourselves tomorrow, God, that our houses would be filled with the joy of the Lord. That temporal things that need batteries and have to get fixed and they, they ultimately don't last as long as we wish they would, all those things would not define us. We would be defined by this eternal purpose. I thank you. Speak your blessing. over this gathering, every life present here, everyone who we will touch when we go out of here. I thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Beautiful Jesus, we honor you. speak the blessing of the Lord over you tonight. I say, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you and your household peace, perfect peace in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. <laughs>